Recently, I've been looking through my computer and found my old blogs from what I can only describe as my slightly younger and much more excited traveling days. Unfortunately, I don't get out much, if at all, now. Anyway, I was having a read-through and came across this one from just over ten days ago. Reading back on this trip has genuinely chilled me to the bone. Partially because I can't really remember any of this happening, and therefore almost felt like I was reliving it as I continued reading. And after finishing, I felt my experience should be shared with you all. I have decided to post my story here for you all. I hope I don't come across as crazy. This was written as it happened at the time. But these are true events. The places, the names, the events themselves. Nothing has been edited. I named this particular blog, The Hotel That Only Sleeps One. Summer 2013. My first trip of the summer. June 1st, Saturday, 9.33 a.m. My name is Steve. I live in a city called Dundee in Scotland. We have the Highlands right on our doorstep, and breathtaking scenery just minutes from the city. It is a fantastic place to live. I work in a school, so I have the whole summer off every year to do what I want, normally spending the final few weeks of term planning trips to remote locations all across the UK. I like to go and visit great hiking spots, climb mountains, fishing trips, sailing, you name it. These are my blogs. I like to keep records of all my trips and share them on various forums and sites, mostly to do with tourism in Scotland but also other parts of the UK for anyone who may be thinking of exploring little-known places that might be near them, or even anyone possibly looking to come to the UK for vacations, or to live, or study, or whatever reason. This is a record of my first trip of 2013. So there's a place way up in the far north of Scotland called Kyosko. It looks beautiful from what I've seen. There's a little 17th century hotel there called the Kyosko Hotel. It is right on the bank of Loch Glendu, pronounced as Glendu, the Gaelic translates to English as Black Glen. For those who don't know, in Scotland, a glen is a term for a deep valley, and a loch is a Scottish or Gaelic term for a body of water, essentially a lake. You may have heard of Loch Lomond or Loch Ness, perhaps more likely the Loch Ness Monster. I urge you to check it out for yourself, and you will see how beautiful this place is, I truly hope one day you might be able to pay a visit. Now, I have been trying for over two years to get a room at this hotel, but every time I check the availability, there's only ever one single room with a single bed available. I mean all year round, not just in the summer. As I was always traveling with my girlfriend, this wasn't an option, so I checked daily, waiting for another room to become available. Maybe I would get lucky with a cancellation. Unfortunately, we separated two months ago, and I just checked. The single room is available. I booked the room for five nights. I've packed my things, and I'm making the four and a half hour drive to Kyosko today. I can't wait. I'll keep my blog updated on my travels as I go on. For now, I'm about to leave. The car is packed. I have a coffee, some snacks, and playlist at the ready. June 1st, Saturday. 12.45 p.m. I made a quick stop to stretch my legs, running about 15 minutes behind schedule, but these roads sometimes are a bit of a pain. I saw this little place on the map and I'd never heard of it before. It's called Roji Falls. It's a bit of a walk through some woods from the car park, but so worth it. Once you come out the other end, there's a little wooden pathway leading to a bridge which crosses over a river called the Blackwater. A pure coincidence, I must add, it has nothing to do with the Black Glen. The falls are beautiful and the trail is easy to navigate. I met a young Welsh family on the way, who were also going north, although they were going to Sky, a portrait to be exact. A portrait has been one of my favorite destinations and I couldn't recommend it enough. I made my way back to the car after a few photos and some exploring. I'm sure you can fish for salmon in this river, but I had to go, unfortunately. I will definitely come back one day for that. Just about to set off for the remainder of my drive. June 1st, Saturday, 3.35 p.m. Just arrived at Kyosko. Took a bit longer than I had expected or hoped, but wow. 
Now, there are actually three locks here, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, the scenery is absolutely out of this world. Rolling hills and mountains in the backdrop, surrounded by almost nothing but fields and locks. My check-in time is 4 p.m., so I took the time to have a wander around the area. Kyosku appears to be mainly just a single road off the A894. If you check it on a map, you will see what I mean. There's a few houses on the road towards Loch Glendu, a little building which seems like it could be a public toilet. Then, at the end, is the Kyosku Hotel. It looks nice. For it to be fully booked, though, I have to say it looks empty. In fact, I haven't seen a single person since I got here. I went back along the road the way I had come from and made the short walk to the Kyosku Bridge. It was a nice little road bridge over the lock. You can just about hear the water below. It's very calm, complemented by the stunning views. I have walked back, but just before I check in, I just wanted to add, I noticed something behind the hotel. There's a little maze, which I'll have to explore, but for now I need to get in and lay down. Possibly eat. June 1st, Saturday, 4.15pm. Okay, so I went to the door. Still haven't seen a single soul in this whole place. It was locked, so I knocked and rang the bell. Eventually, after a bit of a wait, a tall, finely dressed older woman answered. She had dark red hair and large green eyes that seemed to draw your gaze. Ah, oh, Mr. Quinn, we've been expecting you. She spoke in a soft, eloquent manner, with an upper-class-sounding English accent. She continued. Miss Weiss, pleasure to meet you. She extended a hand towards me, then swung it around, crossing the threshold of the door, ushering me into the hotel. She looked stern, and her air of professionalism with every word and movement, but basically she didn't look like she took any shit, and would swiftly solve the problem if you started any. I followed Miss Wise to the reception desk. She went behind the counter, and I approached, smiling. I trust you had a smooth journey, she said, flicking through some papers behind the desk. She pulled out a document and began typing on an old, huge desktop computer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did. Thank you. A little bit behind schedule, but it was fine. I replied. You must run a fine establishment here. It's almost impossible to get a room. She shot a quick glance at me from the computer screen, and the sides of her mouth crept up to a slight smile. She looked back and continued typing. I put my folded arms on the reception desk and leaned in a little closer. So, I began, trying to break the ever-growing uncomfortable silence. I take it there's plenty to do around here. It seems pretty quiet for a fully booked hotel. I chuckled in a jest manner. She never replied. She simply turns to a wall with a bunch of hooks and numbers where only one single key hung. I turned my head quickly, just having a swift, curious look at the computer screen. It wasn't even on. I heard Miss Weiss clear her throat as she caught me looking confused at the screen. Room 28, she said, handing me the key. An unnecessarily large block of wood with a black 28 crudely scrolled onto it, and a single huge brass key attached to the key ring, presumably so nobody would lose it. I took the key, smiled, and thanked Miss Weiss. Her large green eyes held mine for a few seconds. Before I got lost in them, I turned toward the hallway. I stopped. Is this the right way? I asked, unsure of myself. Straight down the hall, take the stairs on the right, one floor up and back down the hallway to the end. The room is directly above where you're standing right now. She replied with her long, red-lipped smile, bearing her perfect white teeth. Her eyes gazed into mine, unflattering. If she wasn't quite so comforting and warm, it would have probably crept me out, but something about her just made me feel like I was at home, safe. I felt an almost maternal bond between us. I made my way to the stairwell, listening intently for signs of life in other rooms. Room 101 seems to have a TV on. I felt like that was confirmation other residents were definitely here. I continued up the stairs, an old wooden staircase and a large brick shell. I assume this is part of the original 17th century building. Some of the hotel has been restored and added to over the years, but much of the original structure remains. I have a thing for old buildings. I like to wonder, who laid these bricks? 
who has walked these same stairs. What stories and memories have been carved into the history of this centuries-old building? If only these walls could talk. I arrive at my room. The block makes an annoying racket as it rattles my door while I struggle to turn the key into the ancient-looking giant lock. It's probably about 300 years old, too, I think to myself. Eventually it yields, and the door creaks open. The room smells like incense. It was pretty large, with a nice thick red carpet, antique-looking wooden furniture, including an old-school vanity table, thing with a mirror and light bulbs all around, a very dated TV, and, surprisingly, a massive four-post bed. It made me wonder why this room was only available for one person. It was definitely large enough for two. I checked out the bathroom, which was located right by the entrance to the room, immediately left as you walk in. It was immaculately white and clean, with a huge bathtub with a shower attachment. I was happy with that. I went back into the room and opened my case to start pulling my clothes away. The bedside alarm clock reads 4.32pm. On the table next to the bed lay a small pamphlet with a map of the area, things to do locally and information about checking in and out at dinner, breakfast, and the bar. I had a quick glance. Dinner begins at 7 p.m. until 11 p.m. Last dinner order was at 10.30. Buffet begins 6 a.m. until 10 a.m. Lunch available 12 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. The menus look good. I will definitely try lunch and dinner at some point. Breakfast is included in the room rates, which is also a bonus. I continue unpacking. I turn to put my stuff in the drawers of the dresser behind me and unpack the rest of my things. Now it's time for a bath, then I'll get ready to go for some dinner around 6.45. June 1st, Saturday, 7.20 p.m. As I walked down to the bar, I heard a baby crying from the room two doors down from me. Number 24. I slowed myself down just to get a listen to see if I could hear the baby's parents. I heard a hushing sound, but no words. As I walked down the stairs, before I got to the bottom, I heard the stairwell door from my landing open and close, then footsteps making their way down. I slowed down again to catch a glimpse, but they stopped after only a few steps. I decided to carry on to the bar. For some reason, I feel like I'm desperately seeking an encounter with another guest of this hotel. Any guest. Not sure if it's due to loneliness or just out of sheer curiosity. The walk through the empty lobby is normal. Miss Weiss dutifully posted at the reception acknowledged me and gave me a tender smile. I nodded and smiled back at her. I entered the bar. Not a single person in here, either, aside from the one solitary bartender. I'm beginning to get some shining vibes here. He smiles at me and gestures to a stool at the bar for me to sit and stares at me the whole way over. Good evening. What can I get you, sir? He said, still smiling wide. His mouth didn't seem to move much from its apparently permanent smile, his eyes almost protruding from his head. He is tall and bulky, quite a large, scary-looking guy, but definitely friendly enough from what I can gather. I'll have a double Glenmorangy. Uh, no ice, please. I replied, smiling back. Can I charge it to room 28? I asked. Of course you can, sir. He turned, smiling as he spoke, although it seemed like his mouth didn't move at all this time. The bartender turned and handed me my whiskey. Enjoy, he said, still smiling. I'm sure his mouth definitely moved this time. I don't know what I'm thinking here. I had a sip and drummed my fingers on the table, looking around the empty room, glancing at the double door, hoping to God someone else comes in. After twenty minutes had passed, not a word was spoken in the bar apart from me ordering another drink. The bartender just stood, smiling, cleaning a tall glass. I don't even remember if he ever changed the glass in his hand. A man in a red blazer appeared behind me. Mr. Quinn, he said softly, may I show you to your seat? I turned and smiled, getting off of my stool. Right this way, sir. He began walking. I was sitting at a round table set for four, again, at nobody in the restaurant area but me. 
The restaurant's seating runs parallel to the bar with floor-to-ceiling windows and two glass double doors as a partition so you can see into the bar and restaurant wherever you're sitting. The silence was beginning to get to me. The only noise was the clinking of my cutlery on my plate. No talking, no laughing or music or anything. The bartender still stood, smiling, cleaning what I'm sure is still the same tall glass. Everyone seems so robotic. My dinner, by the way, was delicious. I had a steak, huge slab of ribeye, cooked to perfection, seasoned to perfection with a side of dauphinized potatoes and some veg. Ten out of ten for the food, seven out of ten for the service, zero out of ten for the atmosphere. I wanted another drink before I retired to my room, but the bartender was really beginning to give me a very strange feeling. I didn't like it, so I decided I would maybe go to the room and order a drink to be brought up. June 1st, 10, 10 p.m. I need to quickly write up what has just happened. I left the bar area, and Miss Weiss was still standing completely still at the reception. She didn't even acknowledge me this time. The TV was still blaring from room 11. Also, rooms 6, 9, 12, and 14 had TVs on, which I can't make sense of as I have seen nobody at all aside from the old staff member. I literally haven't seen anyone walk in or out of this building. Room 24 still had their crying baby. It seems a tiny bit quieter, but mostly exactly the same. I listened intently, walking to my room. There was a couple arguing, some rooms where I could hear indecipherable talking, and more TVs. The hotel, from the hallway, seems to be fully booked. I got into my room, and after a couple of minutes I heard footsteps and doors opening and closing. I checked through the spy hole in the door, but saw nothing. I felt like everyone was avoiding me. I opened my door and looked down the hallway. I saw a door close, but no people. They must have just gone inside. I called room service and asked for two neat double whiskeys to be sent to the room. I could hear what seemed to be the sounds of a couple having sex through my wall. Hopefully the whiskey will put me to sleep. The door rattled and a familiar voice yelled, Room service? It was the waiter from the restaurant, quite possibly the most normal staff member of the three I have met. I took the whiskey from the tray, tipped him a few pounds, and he went on his way although he kept trying to peek inside the room when I was putting the glasses down and getting some change. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Sunday, June 2nd, 1.45 a.m. The couple next door are still having their unrelenting sexual encounter. It's not as loud anymore, at least, but the incessant opening and shutting of doors from the hallway is beginning to annoy me. And the footsteps like multiple people just walking aimlessly up and down. The whiskey had helped me drift off for a little while, but I woke up shortly after. The TV was on static. I flicked through the channels. Channels 1 to 76 were all static. Channel 77 had a grainy image of what appeared to be an old game show I had never seen before. Then the rest were static again. It made me wonder how everyone else seems to be able to get their TV working. I got up to use the toilet. My mouth was dry and my bladder was aching. I turned the light on and immediately turned back around. Something wasn't right. My urge to urinate had dissipated as my heart thumped. Something just happened and I couldn't put my finger on it, like a weird scraping or sliding sound. I scanned the partially lit room, only the glow of the TV and bathroom light to illuminate as much as possible. I stood absolutely frozen still as I squinted to see into every dark corner of the room. Then, I saw it. My cupboard door was half open. I know it wasn't closed because I never put any clothes in there. I haven't even been near the cupboard, but one door has been swung halfway open. I switched the light on. Now, my heart racing, hands trembling, fear building... Now, I really had to fucking pee, but I didn't want to take my eyes off of that cupboard. Instead, I walked back over toward the bed and switched the main light on. It lit up a little bit inside, but there was nothing there. I plucked up the courage to just open the door, get it over with. If I didn't do it soon, I would end up pissing myself and feeling like an idiot. 
I grabbed a portable stove I usually bring in case I end up camping out somewhere for the night. I raised it up and jolted the other door wide open and swung the stove. It hit only the air inside the cupboard. I felt so stupid. I checked everywhere else and under the bed three times. Nothing. Then I felt okay to go and relieve myself of a now shooting pain in my abdomen. I opened my room door once again, just to have a peek down the hall. Again, I found nothing, even though I just heard someone pass my room. I probably won't sleep very well tonight. June 2nd, 7.45 a.m. I did not sleep well last night. The bed was comfortable enough, but the constant banging of doors, and also from next door, coupled with people walking around like mad, just kept me from properly getting to sleep. I'm about to head down for breakfast. I will update when I return. June 2nd, 8.25 a.m. The breakfast was incredible. Buffet style, so everything you need is all out, freshly cooked and ready to go. I may have overindulged, but I need the energy. I had probably the equivalent of about two full Scottish breakfasts, but once again, I was the only person there. The waiter, the same guy from last night, was very attentive, plying me with cups of coffee and making sure everything was up to standard. His name is Brian. He's a nice guy and I was quite happy to tip him five pounds for his trouble. I got back to my room and had found that it had been cleaned to within an inch of its life, so that's always nice. I'm about to try out the shower and then get ready for the day ahead. June 2nd, 8.35 a.m. I was just about to go in the shower when I heard some laughing outside. I sprinted to the window so fast I almost flew out. People. I just saw three people, live humans, entering the maze at the back of the hotel. A man, a woman, and a child. Thank God I'm not insane. Of course there are people here. What the hell was I thinking? I'm thinking of going by myself after my shower. Update will be soon. June 2nd, 12.11 p.m. I went to the maze. I tried following the voices of the people inside, but I could not locate anyone. Sometimes they seemed right in front of me, then all of a sudden, far away, to my side or behind. The maze was actually pretty difficult, but when you finally get to the center, there is a beautiful garden and some markets on the grounds that make up games or activities, like some kind of life-sized board game. If only there were others I could play with. When I got out eventually, I returned to the room to update the blog, and now I will head down for a quick lunch. June 2nd, 1.05 p.m. I have just finished lunch. I had a BLT, salad, and some orange juice. Again, delicious. The kitchen staff here is incredibly skilled. As I walked back to my room to rest for half an hour, the same rooms I passed were still blasting their TVs. The baby still crying, the room next door was quiet, for now. I'm lying in bed and I'm feeling pretty tired already. Maybe I'll take an afternoon nap before I head out for a wander around the area. June 2nd, 8.36pm. I've just woken up to darkness outside and have no idea how I slept so long. The constant banging of doors and footsteps is seriously irritating me. My head is pounding. The TV is on static once again. My cupboard door is once again open. And I'm 90% positive someone has been in my room while I slept. I'm not so sure I want to sleep here another night. I feel like two days have been wasted. People are acting so strange and I'm feeling horrible. I'm packing my things, going downstairs to complain to Miss Weiss that I'm going home. June 2nd, 8.55 p.m. I was just on my way to the reception. As I walked down the hallway, I could hear the usual. The TVs, people chattering, the babies still crying. It just seems a bit off. Something isn't right. I knocked on room 24 just to see if everything was okay. It seemed like this child had been crying for days, but no answer. I knocked on room 20, room 19, room 23. All had TV noises and people chattering inside. Again. 
No answer from anyone. Please do not judge me, but my curiosity was beyond comprehension at this point. I did something I would never dream of doing in a normal situation. I looked through the keyhole of room 20. The TV appeared to be off. I couldn't see much, but I could see what was possibly someone's foot on the bed. I knocked on the door once more. Absolutely no movement. I looked through 19 and 18. Nothing. Room 22, I could see someone sitting in a chair, but they looked asleep, sitting perfectly still and facing away from me. I couldn't make out anything but their shape. I tried room 24. What I saw, I'm almost choking with fear. There were two people in the room, an adult cradling a child in their arms, both absolutely still. The child crying, or at least the sounds of a child crying. I couldn't quite make sense of what I was seeing, but when I could focus better, I saw that they were dummies. Like, I mean, old school crash test dummies you would see on TV or something. No faces, like black and yellow circle things on the sides of their heads. I gasped and sat back on the floor. The baby never stopped crying. What was this? Why are there dummies in the rooms? I checked another couple of rooms and saw old tape recorders playing conversations and background noises. I saw another dummy in each of those rooms, too. I felt myself shiver. My spine had a thousand tiny daggers rolling up it. My hair stood on end. I went back to my room to think about what I should do next. June 2nd, 9.15 p.m. My room phone rang. Miss Weiss asking why I didn't come down for dinner. I told her I wasn't feeling good, so I used the opportunity to make a complaint about the other guests to see what she would say. I haven't been sleeping well. The guests next door to me have been very loud, and other guests on the floor are constantly banging doors. Other guests? She said. Oh, the other guests. Excuse me. I'll come right away and speak to everyone. Hopefully that will help with the noise level. She sounded off, nowhere near as comforting as before. I kept my eyes on the spy hole in my door to see if I could see anything. I also put the latch on because I had a very bad feeling by this point. Miss Weiss arrived at my door within one minute. She was looking down the hall, whispering and waving someone over. I saw the giant, smiling barman arrive with what I'm sure was a machete. I only caught the quickest glimpse before Miss Weiss put her finger to her mouth, telling a third person to be quiet. Then she put her thumb over the spy hole. The door knocked, and Miss Weiss spoke. Mr. Quinn, could you show me which of your neighbors are making all the noise, please? It will only take a minute. Her words rang like they were in a tunnel, echoed in my ears. I felt dizzy, faint. I was panicking, but I didn't want her to know. Uh, it, yes, give me two minutes. I'm just out of the shower. I began pacing around the room, thinking of what I could possibly do. She knocked the door again. I'm almost ready. Uh, I'm sorry. I shouted from the far end. I looked out the window. If I could hang out and swing over a bit, I could make it to a sloping roof just off to the side, then probably make it down okay from there. It was genuinely my only option. I dangled my legs, holding on to the sill, and started swinging side to side. I threw my legs up for one last push of momentum and let go, almost breaking my ankles as I crashed to the sloping roof. I began to slide down. I could now hear banging on the room door and some shouting. I clung to a pipe and slowly lowered myself as low as I could get before my hands quickly gave up. I found myself falling to the ground below. When I landed, I looked up, and to my absolute horror, saw the barman's head leaning out of my window and quickly disappearing again. Time was of the essence. I sprinted to my car and grabbed for my keys. I... I could have cried right on the spot. My car keys were still in my room. 
Hearing the voices grow louder as three people emerged from the hotel entrance, I decided my only option now was just to run. I ran along Kyle's school road until I met one of the adjacent houses. It was in darkness, so I rattled the window as I ran past and hopped the fence to the next. It was also in darkness, but at a car parked outside. I banged on the window and door before quickly jumping to the next garden. There was a light on at the far end of this house. I banged frantically on the door, then ran to the window. I saw a family inside and banged the window. They never responded. I banged again hard, and then I noticed. Black and yellow circles on their heads as they sat motionless in various poses. I felt helpless, drained. I felt sick. I slumped to the ground and sobbed. Why the fuck did I forget my keys? Footsteps quickly found me, and before I could react, the world went dark. Unknown time. My head was spinning. I could taste horrible, thick, coppery saliva running down my throat. I was bound to a chair, hands and feet. Footsteps approaching. A man walked in. I could barely see in the shady, dim light, but the silhouette resembled the giant bartender. He had some sort of club or pipe in his hand and a cup of coffee in the other. He sat himself on a stool in the corner of the room. Then Miss Weiss came in, looking very different, cigarette in her hand and looking generally more rough, for lack of a better term. She sat at a table across from me and blew smoke in my face and laughed. So, Mr. Quinn, you've made it to the recruitment stage. Well done. Most tend to end up trying their luck by attacking some of us. That doesn't bode well for the vast majority of people who have discovered our secrets prematurely. You have been one of the lucky ones. Lucky? I asked, sarcastic, but not taking anything away from the absolute fear in my voice. Yes, Mr. Quinn. Lucky. Only a few have made it this far. The only other option is being buried in the maze, so I would consider your current situation lucky. If you tried anything else, you would have not been so lucky, I can assure you that much. She glanced over at the husk of a bartender. He sat, staring and smiling. Miss Weiss continued. Terry here will begin your training shortly. It should only be a couple of days. Then, if you pass, we'll have you fitted with a uniform, and you will be assigned a post. Sound good? Any questions? Only about a thousand, I thought to myself. I'm not sure I understand what's going on. Are you telling me I'll be working here? Why? What training are you talking about? I asked in quick succession. I thought that was made quite clear. Of course you will be working here. You'll have a place to stay and a job for life, and you will assist us in our recruitment. We will be expanding soon enough and are in dire need of more staff. She laughed as if all of that was apparently obvious and I was an idiot for not knowing. As for your training, she continued, it's simple enough. Terry will show you some videos, mostly to do with loyalty, obedience, what and what not to do in various situations should any arise within our grounds as well as some clips on what you can expect to witness where you are with us. And our Brian will interview you on a number of occasions. It's unlikely you will sleep for two or three days, but it is for the best. It will be over before you know it. She quickly spun on her heels and walked out the sliding wooden door before I could ask anything else. I couldn't believe how nonchalant she was about the way she described all of this to a tied-up, beaten man. I looked at Terry, his bulging eyes and haunting smile now seemed so menacing I could only glance for a few seconds. A VCR sat on the table. He pointed to a remote controller which started a video playing from a projector that took up the entire wall. Terry never moved, so the projection played over him too. Every time the light reflected on his massive eyes, it gave me chills. They never moved from my direction. The fifteen minute or so movies were all weird propaganda stuff, like old Nazi and Soviet introduction clips and horrible clips of genocide. To be honest, I wasn't sure what this was supposed to be teaching me. 
The movie stopped. Then, Brian entered the room. What do you think of what you just saw? He asked. I don't really know. I know what it was, but why was I shown this? I was utterly dumbfounded. You see, people like Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, they showed absolutely no mercy to traitors. The poor souls you saw there being massacred in their thousands were traitors. So you see what happens to traitors. I'm pretty positive that isn't true, Brian. That those people were mostly civilians. Killed for who they were, not what they've done. There were babies among those victims. How can a baby be a traitor? Those people. He screamed and pounded his fist on the table. Those people were traitors. I don't care who they were. The point is, this is what happens to traitors. He sighed. It's early now, but you will see soon enough. He nodded to Terry and left the room. Another video clicked on. This was another clip video. It showed men treating women like dogs in dingy looking rooms, slapping them and beating them if they didn't comply. Maybe a bowl of water if they were good. There were then a couple of clips of women running, escaping, and being hunted down by two guys with crossbows. The next video started immediately after. It showed some of the most horrible scenes I have ever witnessed. Men having their hearts cut out while still alive, cannibalism, torture of women and men, people having their bodies mutilated, animals being slaughtered, anything you can think of. It was on that tape. He made me watch it for hours while he just sat there, smiling and staring at me. Miss Weiss entered the room again, smoking still. Mr. Quinn, do you understand why you're being shown these videos? My eyes felt hot. Horrible scenes looped in my head. I said nothing. It's to give you a sense of reality. Everything you have witnessed happens to someone and was in turn committed by someone. This is what we are capable of, and this happens every day. It's not to dehumanize you, but more to desensitize you to the wicked nature of humans. She looked at Terry, then back at me. Words were forming in my mouth, but could not escape. We must teach you obedience and fear of disobedience. We must instill indestructible loyalty in our staff, fear of disloyalty, and an unconditional love for that fear. Love for your colleagues, and love for your new place in this world. She stared into my glazed eyes as if she were listening to my thoughts. Let me tell you something, she began again. Terry here was my first recruit. There are eight of us here, but Terry was my first. He came here looking for a place to stay the night on his way to Shetlands for work. He was my first customer when I opened four years ago. He was the only one here. We sat and drank all night, talked about all manner of things. She looked mournfully at Terry, who sat and smiled anyway. We drank until the sun came up. He couldn't drive that day, of course, so I offered him another night free of charge. And we did the exact same thing the following night. I eventually convinced Terry to work here for me. It's closer to Glasgow, where he is from, and I offered good money, and of course free accommodation. The hotel business isn't easy. You have staff coming and going, and you never really know who you are hiring. So we came up with an idea. To create perfect staff members who will follow orders to the letter and never question authority. They will work here until they cannot work anymore, and best of all, they will add absolutely no expense to the company. They will do it because they want to do it. I am recruiting now because I am about to open a new hotel, and I need more staff. She smiled at me as my mouth gaped open. By the end of your session, you will give everything to me, to our company. You will follow my lead, and you will never question a thing. She stopped and glanced over at Terry. If you ever feel a question forming on your lips, I suggest you keep it to yourself. Isn't that right, Terry? She continued to stare at me as I turned to Terry, still smiling as her mouth hung open. I felt my stomach turn. 
Terry's tongue had been completely removed from his mouth. I looked back at Miss Wise. She was smiling, with smoke billowing from her flared nostrils. And he's my favorite, she chuckled. So best just keep your mouth shut from now on. Brian will be in shortly to ask you some questions. I'll be back later. Terry left another video playing. More murder and torture videos intermingled with short, grotesque, weird clips I can't even explain. He followed Miss Weiss out of the room. About half an hour later, Brian walks in and sits at the table. The video had stopped playing moments before. So, Steve, he ruffled some papers. I just need to ask you a few questions in private. You can be honest with me. Miss Weiss has a strict testing procedure, and she will never see these notes. All I have to do is make an assessment on where we take this proceeding going forward. Does that make sense? None of this makes sense, I replied. My voice was weak and tired. Perfect, he said. Then we're making progress, he smiled. Now, I understand these questions may seem random, but you are just going to have to trust me here. It will make sense eventually. He stared me dead in the eyes. So, let's start with an easy one. Question one. What is your biggest fear? He asked. I paused for a few seconds. I don't really know. Dying, maybe. The unknown. I really don't know. That's fine, Ryan said. There are no wrong answers here. Question two. He continued. Have you ever felt like you wanted to do something drastic, something that can't be undone, for instance, when standing near the edge of a train platform when a train is coming, or on a bridge, perhaps? Have you ever felt the urge to jump and wonder why you felt that way? I looked at him, confused. To be fair, I had felt that before, but I always thought everyone had at one point. Um, no, I mean, I have, but... Before I could finish what I was saying, he was already scribbling on a piece of paper. Question three. Have you ever seen a real dead body? While he asked this, he held up the piece of paper he was scribbling on. In large, scribbled words, it read, Do not react. They are listening. Do you want me to repeat the question? He said. So many things were running through my mind. Was this a test? Was he genuinely trying to help? I did need him to repeat the question because I couldn't think straight. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, I'm feeling so tired. Uh, what was the question? I managed to stutter. Have you ever seen a dead body? He quickly fired back. He sounded agitated. I wasn't sure if that was for show or if he was getting annoyed at me. I, I saw my grandmother when I was young. It was an open casket funeral. That's the only time. I watched as he scribbled on another sheet of paper. He said, Okay, Steve, that's fine. He held up the other piece of paper as he spoke. The paper read, Answer question five. Leave immediately. Quick and quiet. Keys on the bed. I'll stall them. Okay, question four. How do you feel about capital punishment? Do you believe in an eye for an eye, carried out by the justice system or otherwise? He scribbled more erratically. I still didn't know if this was a test or not. I don't think I've ever thought about it much. I'd probably disagree with it, but probably most people would say that until there was something happening to them. If it was my parents or child murdered by someone, then I'd probably like to see them dead too. Really, I don't know. That's fantastic, Steve, Brian said, smiling, holding another sheet of paper. This one said, get ready, be quiet. There are others outside. I won't make it. Try getting help. Stephen, don't start falling asleep. Sit up straight. We only have another 16 questions, then we're all done. He walks behind me and slices the rope that bounds my hands and sat quickly back down. Shoulders straight, head up. That's better. Question five. He nodded at me. I nodded back. I frantically untied the rope at my ankles. He continued. 
Have you ever filed a report to the authorities that resulted in another person's arrest? No, I said, and immediately stood up, ready to go. Brian held his hand up and rotated his finger as if to keep me talking. Nothing at all, he said, eyes widening, urging me to speak. Um, once, when I was a child, three boys punched and kicked me in school. I told the head and my teacher, but I never told any police. They were kids. They would have never been arrested. But if you consider the headmaster an authoritarian figure and the arrest is a punishment, then, yeah, they were punished, but that's the only time. He jerked his thumb to the side towards the door. I began walking lightly and swiftly. Brian repeated what I had said as he wrote it down. Okay, give me a second to write all that down, Steve. Make sure I don't miss anything. I slid the door very carefully to the side. Brian's still talking behind me. So, you were in school and some kids bullied you. Okay, then you said you spoke to the teachers and the head, but never the police. I walked out of the door and Brian's voice faded. There was another smaller door. I opened it and stepped out. I couldn't believe it. I had just stepped out of the cupboard in my hotel room. Bastards were probably in here all the time while I slept, no doubt. Brian was right. My keys were lying on the pillow. I picked them up, trying not to jangle them about too much. I had a quick look out the window. It was almost pitch darkness. I saw a man and a woman talking with cigarettes in their hands. It was two people I hadn't seen before. I did consider taking the window route again, but that was now a no-go. I crept towards the door. There was dead silence. No TVs, no footsteps or doors banging, only Brian's faint voice repeating my answer again, pretending to write it down. It wouldn't be long before they realized something was up. I had to move. My room door was slightly ajar, so I was able to open it without sound. I presume he left it that way for me. The halls were very dimly lit, with almost no light at all. I tried to walk fast while staying quiet, but my legs were trembling. I heard Brian shout as I reached the stairwell. Wake up, Stephen. And then I heard a bang. I looked back and saw Miss Weiss and Terry emerging from a door three down from my room. They made a beeline for room 28. This was it. I bolted down the wooden stairs, praying nobody was at the bottom. I sprinted along the hallway and came to the reception. Two men were sitting in the bar area and looked right at me. They stood up and started running. I made it to the door. It was locked. I dashed back to the reception and pulled the huge PC monitor over, ripping the wires out as I did. Just as they entered the lobby, I launched it through a window and dived through straight after, cutting myself in multiple places as I landed in a bush filled with broken glass. My car sat across the road. I got myself up and saw the hotel front door swing open. My legs were like jelly. They barely carried me to my car, but with every last morsel of strength I had in my body, I made it with nothing to spare. Key at the ready, I threw it in the ignition and locked the doors as the two men who were wearing chef whites battered my windows and pulled my door handles. They started kicking my doors and windows, screaming as I was able to throw the car into reverse and get out of the space. One of them fell to the ground as I spun around. The other made a jump for the windscreen. In my rear view, I saw Terry running from the hotel, wielding a huge machete. He was unnaturally fast. He gave chase all the way to the end of the road. I flung my car left just as I saw headlights switch on behind me. This wasn't going to be good. The closest place I could think that would have any sort of civilization was Olapol, almost an hour drive. I just put the boot down. These roads are dangerous, but I had to take the risk. If I get caught, who knows what they might do. I had a reasonable head start, but every straight section of road I would see the headlights come into view. There were two in pursuit. They would gain some grounds, but when the corners hit, I seemed to have the upper hand and would increase the gap. This was the most terrifying thing that had ever happened to me up until this point in my life. Speeding on these roads with the lowest visibility and a bunch of lunatics behind you trying to catch you. There's nowhere to go but forward and hope for the best. When I reached Eulapool, the street lights made me feel safe. I saw people, cars, and life. I never felt so relieved. 
I haven't seen the cars behind me for the last couple of miles. I assumed they didn't want to venture into a town with cameras and witnesses to kidnap someone. I felt free, liberated, safe. I wept on my steering wheel. I waited about two hours to regain some composure. I thought about Brian. I can't say for sure, but I don't imagine he's still alive, or will be for much longer. There was a definite feeling about him from our first encounter, that he was less uh, programmed than the others. If helping me was a death sentence, then he knew it, and he gave his life to stop them enslaving another innocent person. I hope whatever they do, he suffers as little as possible. I owe my life to a dead man. I began driving home after fueling up and getting some water. Every time a car would appear behind me, I would get that crippling fear, but nothing ever happened. I made it home without incident. I wanted to get in, get a shower, and lie in my own bed as fast as possible. I just wanted to sleep and try my best to forget. I opened my front door and stepped inside. My old familiar house smell. I was so happy to be home. I threw all the mail on the table and started taking my bloodied clothes off. There were cuts all over me. Little bits of glass poked out of a few places in my body. I walked back to the hall towards the bathroom and got a glimpse of an envelope. A plain blue envelope with no postmarks and only my name written on it. I opened it. My blood ran cold as I read. The Kyle School Hotel headed letter. Dear Mr. Quinn, I am writing to you to express my deepest sorrow at your premature departure from the Kyle School Hotel. Upon your hasty exit, you did in fact manage to forget to settle your bill. As we understand, these things happen, and to show how grateful we are that you chose to stay with us and how sad we are you had to leave so quickly, we will not be charging you for the full stay. I have had a staff member deliver your revised bill and receipt personally for your records. Payment of this new amount will be taken from the original payment method and details you provided upon your booking. We hope to see you again in the near future. Kind regards, signed, Catherine Weiss. They know where I live. Update from today, just before I post this. I googled this hotel, and it has changed massively in appearance in the eight years since I was a guest. I just wonder if it has changed in any other way. If the hotel still houses the same corrupt, sick-minded individuals. I decided I would phone to inquire about booking a room, just to see what happens. I dialed the number on my phone. Good morning, Kyosko Hotel. How may I help you? A very familiar, soft English accent spoke. Comforting, inviting, professional, haunting. I remained silent, listening intently. Mr. Quinn, how may I help you, sir? The voice began a long, low, breathy laugh. I hung my phone up and threw it on the floor. Miss Weiss's face is burned into my mind's eye. I got goosebumps having flashbacks of the Kyosku Hotel. What compelled me to find out if the hotel was still run by Miss Weiss now has me shrouded in a deep, worrying, sick feeling. I wanted to call to be sure, because on the websites, there are now more rooms available. And what's more unsettling, they have family rooms. I seriously hope nobody brings their children to this hotel.